Hello there, you're watching Al24 News coming up next in our news program. Two loud explosions rocked Uganda's capital Kampala early today Tuesday, sparking chaos and confusion as people flood what is widely believed to be coordinated attacks. And in our news file, we will be discussing the latest insights regarding the Tunisian government opening dialogue with Labour Union and street protest anger. And finally, a virtual meeting was held by the leaders of two superpowers, the US and China. The meeting called for lowering the tension between the two poles and tackled numerous files. Hello again and welcome. First in our top stories, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and National Community Abroad stated that the ministerial meeting of African Union Peace and Security Council, which was organized via remote video communication technology, was devoted to discussing the issue of combating terrorism and violent extremism in the African continent. The head of the Algerian diplomacy, La Mamra, highlighted the need for, to formulate and adopt a comprehensive and integrated approach based on specific circumstances of each country and aimed at addressing terrorism routes. La Mamra noted that his statement is based on lessons learned from Algeria's experience in the field of combating terrorism and violent extremism. The first session of the dialogue between the government and the Tunisian General Labour Union was held under the chairmanship of its secretary, General Nouradine Taboubi, in the capital Tunis. Prime Minister Boudin stressed that the dialogue with labour organisation must be honest and frank to establish in a participatory action between the two parties as they must move at steady pace towards radical reforms and achieve demands of Tunisians. Islam Sida reports. The Tunisian government chose dialogue in the course of resolving crisis in Tunisia, immediately following its first meeting with the General Labour Union as the main and active partner in the projects and reforms to be adopted by the government an agreement on a participatory working methodology to meet the demands of Tunisians. The president of the Tunisian government, Nejla Bowden, emphasized on the historic role of the Labour Union, considering it to be an active partner in all the projects put forward by the government and the necessary reforms. Tunisian Employment Minister Nasreddin Sibi said on Monday that despite the country's financial crisis, the government remains dedicated to fulfilling any agreements reached with the country's powerful UGTT union, such as on the minimum salary. Tunisia resumed talks with the International Monetary Fund last week on a loan package conditional on Tunisia undergoing costly and an unpopular economic reforms. International funders have also stressed the importance of broad domestic support for reforms to combat corruption and waste, implying that the government will need the UGTT support, which represent one million workers and hold significant political influence to succeed. And to talk more about the latest insights regarding Tunisia, I am joined live by Mohamed Qirad, Professor of Public Relations and Mass Communication at Qaboos University in Muscat, Oman. Well, first of all, welcome uh, Mr. Mohamed Qirat. I would like to ask you in the beginning, what do you think that the dialogue that the Tunisian government has started with labor union is going to succeed? Well, first of all, whenever you have dialogues, we have talks between political parties, between uh, the president and the very strong uh, 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 workers' union, UGTT. This is a good sign. Uh, mainly the UGTT is asking for not reinstating the parliament because they, you know, they, they said that they didn't uh, do any good to the Tunisian people. But now uh, we have to think of other uh, political parties, other uh, bodies in the country that should also cooperate and work, you know, and get into this dialogue. And because for the time being, since July the 25th, uh, the president of Tunisia is monopolizing the power, political power. And, you know, he has no choice but, you know, to go back to normalcy, to go back to uh, the bodies of the country 
and you know try to to share the power and to go back to the to the democracy and to the parliament and the constitution and if we go back to the UGTT, they are asking for legislative uh, elections as soon as possible so they can get out of uh, this uh, i said you know it's it's uh, deadlock for the time being since july the 25th you know uh, tunisia, tunisia is ruled by one man it's a one man show yes. and it's time yeah, now that they have to yes, to to, uh, to get into dialogue and discuss Dr. the issues muhammad uh, do you think that this dialogue is going to calm the anger of protests of Tunisians who prefer to take it to the streets? Well, it depends on what are the actions. You know, it's not a matter of, you know, uh, having a dialogue, it's, it's a good sign. It's like, you know, we are going forward. But what are the actions? And I think the case uh, Sayed has to, to activate, they ha you know, he has to take action uh, as soon as possible because wh whenever you are late you are not taking actions you know this is going to backfire against you so i think if they are serious and they get other actors in the political scene in tunisia i think they can go ahead and reach its consensus and get away with this crisis that lasts from july so and the first thing that uh, Faisal Said has to do it just to call for legislative uh, elections as Thank soon as possible so they can get, you know, uh, some actions there. They can, at, when they, they will have, you know, the parliament, that will be a good sign, you know, to start the other reforms and changes in Tunisia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohamed Qirat, Professor of Public Relations and Mass Communication at Qaboos University in Muscat, Oman. You joined us live. And moving on to another story, Prime Minister of National Unity Government in Libya, Abdel Hamid Adbeba, considered December's election law flawed and acts to serve specific candidates, indicating that he would announce whether he runs for the presidency at the crucial moment. Zahrari followed the story. Libyans are hoping the elections and the state of division between the different parties. However, they have become a dilemma after they were considered the only way out of the current conjuncture. In the depth of the crisis, the Prime Minister of the Libyan Interim Government of National Unity, Abdel Hamid Dabeiba, attacked the election law, considering it to serve specific candidates. There are many obstacles in the way of the Libyan elections, including the rules for organizing this consultation, which has worsened the Libyan scene. Especially after the announcement of Aqila Saleh, who ratified the presidential election law without involving the Supreme Council in his intention to run. Saif al-Islam's legal status is also a matter of controversy, as he is wanted by the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity. In light of these recent developments taking place in Libya, with the Libyan elections approaching the end of next December, Khalifa Haftar, who holds American citizenship, also entered the line by announcing his official candidacy for the presidential elections amid Libyan warnings of the consequences of this step. The Moroccan government decided to withdraw the draft law number 10.16 related to the completion and change of the criminal code from the House of Representatives, which includes an article on the criminalization of illicit enrichment after nearly six years of its referral to the legislative institution, which sparked lots of controversy among experts. Hussam reports. The Moroccan government's withdrawal of the draft criminal law from the parliament sparked controversy in the country between those who argued that the reasons for the withdrawing the law are related to the text of illegal enrichment and those who saw that it was withdrawn in order to introduce amendments, including those related to pre-trial detention and some texts related to individual freedoms. The project, which was referred by the government of Abdel Ilah bin Kiran to parliament in 2016, sparked a lot of debates in the legislative institution, preventing it from being discussed, especially the parts related to the illegal enrichment. Amid the surprise of the Moroccan people, many political parties expressed their concern, describing what happened as a dangerous slip of the government. The Moroccan government justified the move by the necessity of discussing the controversial bill as a whole. Mustafa Bites, minister delegate to the prime minister in charge of relations and parliament and the government official spokesperson, 
said that the leader decided to withdraw the draft criminal law from parliament due to the difficulty of discussing it in parts. A 26-year-old Palestinian was put to death on Monday after the clashes between Palestinians and the Zionist occupation forces in the city of Tubas. Palestinian Ministry of Health stated that Saddam Hussein Beni Ouda received a bullet on his left shoulder to penetrate to his heart. Zionist occupation forces started many rest stations around the country, starting with seven citizens in the West Bank. And to talk more about the Palestinian cause, and as we mark the 33rd anniversary of the birth of the Palestinian state here in Algeria, by late Palestinian President Yasser Arafat, I'm joined live by Mr. Murad Ati, assistant lecturer from Galma University, who joins us live via Skype. Well, first, can we say that the Palestinian cause is going through a critical stage? Is it caused by Arabs' normalization deals or because of a decline in the international interest since Joe Biden, president of the United States, has not taken any step towards the Palestinian issue so far? Yes, thank you. First of all, thanks for having me today. Uh, that's right. First of all, let me just uh, stress something of a huge importance, which is the fact that um, the Declaration of Independence in uh, November 15, 1988, was from here, from Algiers, and Algiers was was known to be uh, um, called Mecca of the Revolutionaries, as put by Amir Khan Cabral. Uh, we used to have uh, not only the PLO, the Palestinians, we used to have the the the, the American Black Panthers, uh, Carmichael and uh, um, Elridge Cleaver, and so on. So Algiers was re was really um, the Mecca of the, re the revolutionaries. Um, yes, to your question, the situation is very, very critical. Um, the size of the West Bank is diminishing, diminishing day after day after the the the, the, uh, the settlements which were uh, established there, and uh, the the uh, U.S. administration and the Democrats in general, they had a different approach when compared to the uh, uh, aggressive foreign policy of the Republicans, uh, let alone with under uh, uh, Donald Trump. I can give you an example of the um, the issue of the uh, uh, establishing uh, an American consulate in, Jer in Jerusalem. Um, the Israelis, for, for sure, they said no to that. We only have one uh, uh, diplomatic rep representation. So the Biden administration Administration is totally different from the the predecessor, and yes, the situation is is critical at different different levels. Uh, after the normalization process with several Arab countries, mainly those of the Gulf countries and the the the, the uh, Kingdom of Morocco as well. Now. The Algerians are the, the only ones who really back up the Palestinians um, openly. There is nothing to, to, to hide. And the, the normalization process affected the Algerians as well. With the visit, for, for instance, of the um, Israeli uh, Minister of Defense to, to, to Morocco, this is an act of war because the Algerians do back the Palestinians. Do you think, uh, Mr. Murad, that the internal Palestinian, Palestinian, if we can call it this way, affected the course of the Palestinian cause? For sure, the internal conflicts are very dangerous for any cause. So the the the, the ongoing of the events in uh, in in Palestine, uh, um, although there were several attempts by the Egyptians and and many other states to uh, try to solve the the problem of the the internal conflict, which is affecting so much the uh, the uh, the Palestinian cause. Uh, I can give you an example of the the importance of the this uh, this unity between the uh, Palestinians themselves. The example is after the. Uh, Sheikh Jarrah events, the Gazawis and Hamas, they, they, they waged the attack because of the events of the Sheikh Jarrah uh, um, uh, in, in, in Jerusalem. So uh, if they could settle this uh, internal conflict, this will serve the cause more and more. And the issue of elections, which were postponed by the PLO and Mahmoud Abbas uh, a few months ago, did, did really uh, uh, more harm than good to the, to, to the cause. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Murad Aati, Assistant Lecturer from the Gelma University. You, you joined us live via Skype. And according to the Middle East, in 24, the Lebanese Minister of Information, George Qardahi, said he is open to any solution that benefits Lebanon and restores its relations with the Gulf states after a diplomatic crisis with his country, following a pro over his statements about the war in Yemen. And Qardahi added to the Lebanese MTV channel, quote, I feel 
with the people and understand their concerns and I am not stumbling block and I am not stubbornly clinging to the ministry because the ministry is not mine and doesn't belong to my home. Two loud explosions rocked Uganda's capital Kampala early today Tuesday, sparking chaos and confusion as people fled what is widely believed to be a coordinated attack. According to Emmanuel Anibayun, a spokesman from the Ministry of Health said in a Twitter post, at least 24 people have been hospitalized with injuries sustained in the blasts. Four of them are critically injured, as he said. At Parliament Avenue, where the second explosion occurred, all the streets have been cordoned off by security with legislators and Parliament staff evacuated. The Allied Democratic Forces, an affiliate of the so-called Islamic State group, is Central Africa, claimed responsibility for the attack on the Italy. A leaked report stated that the Nigerian army fired live bullets at peaceful demonstrations at a toll gate in Lagos in October 2020. The violence committed by the army could be considered massacre. The shooting ended weeks of protests against police brutality. Hussam reports. A leaked judicial report revealed that the Nigerian army and police shot and killed an armed protesters in October last year before cleaning and removing all evidence. The report, which was submitted to the Lagos state government on Monday, was based on a year-long investigation about police force abuse and killing at Lake Gate in Lagos. It found that 11 unarmed people were killed and four others were missing and presumed dead. The report identified a total of 48 victims. The leaked report described the incident as a massacre and said that most of the army officers deployed at the troll gate were not fit and suitable for service. I recommended that some policemen should be prosecuted for their actions. It's worth mentioning that in October 2020, many thousands of mostly young Nigerians took the streets in protests across several cities, demonstrating against police brutality and bad governance. In the midst of tensions between London and Paris over channel crossings, French police cleared a major migrant camp on Tuesday today that was hoped to roughly a thousand migrants seeking to reach Britain. More details in this report. According to British authorities, a record numbers of migrants crossed the channel in small boats last Thursday, totally 1,185, which the British government termed as unacceptable. On Monday, French Interior Minister Gérald Darmanin met with his British counterpart Priti Patel after giving a frank interview in which he stated Britain should stop using us as a punch ball in their domestic politics. In a tweet, Priti Patel said, quote, Last night I spoke to my French counterpart Gérald Darmanin to discuss the problem of small boats crossing the channel. We discussed a range of additional steps to tackle the problem and restated the importance of working together to make this deadly route unviable." Unquote. For his part, Darmanin claimed on Tuesday morning that police had removed the camp in Grand Sand, near the port of Dunkirk. Relations between France and Britain are at the lowest point in decades due to a host of disagreements on issues, ranging from migrants to fishing in the Channel, as well as a submarine contract with Australia. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson stated last Monday that his country will head to Article 16 clause if they don't come to a radical negotiated solution to the Northern Ireland trade problem. Ayad Usama reports. The crisis between London and Brussels over Northern Ireland protocol issues started a tension in the region after a Brexit decision taken by UK government. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson stated on Monday that he's concerned about settling a negotiated solution to the issue and that if his government will rise a dispute, it will do it in a proper way, as he put it. Boris Johnson, during Glasgow COP26 climate summit, stated that his government is in seek of a negotiated solution and he threatened that he would invoke Article 16, which he considered a legitimate part of the protocol. Complications between Brussels and London rose in the last few weeks. Britain was not satisfied about the agreement signed in 2020 and threatened to trigger the emergent Article 16 clause that would provoke trade war in the region and Europe. Brussels hasn't shown any reaction to the last declarations of the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. However, it will likely depend on how far London goes with the measures that will take. 
British government and the European Union agreed last week on intensifying efforts to find a radical negotiated solution to the post-Brexit problem, which concerns trade issue and the borders between UK and European Union, after Brussels welcomed Britain's speech about the matter. As a reminder, the Article 16 is the Protocol on Northern Ireland, come only abbreviated to the Northern Ireland Protocol. It is a protocol to the Brexit withdrawal agreement that governs the unique customs and immigration issues at the border in the island of Ireland between the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland of the European Union. The European Union agreed to set up sanctions against Belarus over thousands of migrants stranded in freezing forests on its borders with the EU. And France has warned Russia that NATO would not be prepared to defend the sovereignty of Ukraine, where it is alleged Moscow has been staging a true building up. In this report, we will know much more. The sanctions regime was amended by way of a council decision and a council regulation, which broadened the listing criteria on which specific designation can be based. The European Union will now be able to target individuals and entities organizing or contributing to activities by the Lukashenko regime that facilitate illegal crossing of the European Union's external borders. The European Union has agreed to step up sanctions against Belarus, who is accused of pushing migrants towards its Polish and Lithuanian borders to undermine security. The European Union says Moscow has a role in building the migration pressure and could actively help in easing it. I talked with the Belarusian minister to tell him that the situation was completely unacceptable, that humanitarian help has to be provided and that we have to think about how can we solve the problem, starting by stopping the flow, stopping the flights. This is almost done. The sanctions are always effective. They're always effective because they affect people, they affect their wealth and their capacity of movements. And today we are going to approve a new package of sanctions against uh, Belarusian people responsible for what's happening in the country. French President Emmanuel Macron raised concerns as Moscow said to be staging a troop build-up near Ukraine borders. An advisor to Macron told reporters of the conversation Macron initiated via phone call to Russian President Vladimir Putin as part of an outbreak of conversations between Western leaders and Russia, Belarus and Ukraine. The French reader spoke of his strong concern over the situation on Ukraine's borders. Today's decision follow the European Council conclusions of 21 and 22 October 2021, in which European Union leaders declared that they would not accept any attempt by third countries to instrumentalize migrants for political purposes, condemned all hybrid attacks at the European Union's borders and affirmed that it would respond accordingly. A virtual meeting was held by the leaders of the two superpowers, the U.S. and China. The meeting called for lowering the tension between the two poles and tackled numerous files. Taiwan issue was on the top file that the two leaders discussed. Ayedi Usama reports. A three-hour virtual meeting was held on Monday between U.S. leader Joe Biden and his counterpart Xi Jinping. This long high-level diplomacy meeting discussed various files. The start was when Biden stated that the responsibility of these two superpowers' leaders should remain positive, and it's their responsibility to prevent the relations between the two economic poles from veering to a conflict, whether intended or unintended. Chi started the meeting by calling his American counterpart as his old friend, as both of the presidents seemed determined to decrease tension in the relation between the countries on the most turbulent areas of their relations. As stated by Chinese officials, Taiwan issue was the top file in the talk. This comes after Chinese military deployed increasing numbers of fighter jets near Taiwan, which they consider as part of the territories while U.S. considers the island as self-ruled. Chinese military held exercises near Taiwan region in response to the visit of the American congressional delegation in the island. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Xiao Lijiang stated Monday that Taiwan issue concerns China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, adding that it's China's core interest. 
Despite the domestic challenges, Biden was described to come to the median from a position of force, while Xi stressed that China and U.S. should coexist in peace and respect the win-win cooperation between the two countries. No joint statement was released by the two leaders, as they both showed that face-to-face -face meeting is more preferable for further discussions. Aung Suu Kyi has been accused with 15 others of man manipulating the 2020 election. Such allegations were used by the army to justify the coup, which took place in February. Islam Sidi reports. Myanmar generals set off charges against the former president Aung San Suu Kyi, along with 15 others, including the former head of commission for foreign elections. The accusations come at a time when Myanmar military led a coup on February on the pretext of violations and lawless actions, after which Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy won in a landslide during the November ballots in which monitors who observe the polls emphasize on the credibility and transparency of elections. On the other hand, the overthrown Myanmar leader lawyers have said that she couldn't attend a court hearing for health reasons. According to the state-run Global New Light of Myanmar, the 16 members violated a number of electoral laws, including over-military polling booths, advanced voting for people above 60 years of age, and getting the names of people who had no right to cast votes on the ballot. The coup put an end to a 10-year democratic experiment in which the military was guaranteed a role in governance under a constitution crafted by the latter. The coup has sparked enormous outrage resulting in protests, huge civil disobedience and the formation of people's defense forces to combat the military, according to the Assistant Association for Political Prisoners, which has been tracking the response, 1,260 individuals have been slain as security forces try to suppress opposition to their government. OPEC said that global oil market will switch from being under to oversupplied as early as next month as the economic rebound from the coronavirus pandemic flatters. Marwa reports. OPEC Secretary General He Mohammed Sanusi Barkindo attended the opening ceremony of the 2021 edition of Abu Dhabi International Petroleum Exhibition and Conference in Abu Dhabi United Arab Emirates. The four-day gathering that started Monday is taking place in the wake of the COP26 climate talks and with energy prices soaring. The oil market Brent crude has climbed almost 60% this year to above $80 a barrel, while natural gas prices in Asia and Europe hit record highs recently. OPEC Secretary General Mohamed Barkindo said on the sidelines of an energy conference when asked if he was sure there would be an excess in oil supply next year. He also said that the global oil market will switch from being under to oversupplied as early as next month as the economics rebound from the coronavirus pandemic falters, quote, the surplus is already beginning in December, end quote. He also told reporters these are signals that we have to be be very, very careful. His comments come in the shadow of U.S. politicians putting pressure on President Joe Biden to bring down gasoline prices, possibly by banning crude experts and realizing oil from the government's strategic reserve. Biden's next move has been a key topic in Abu Dhabi, where some of the world's biggest oil and gas companies and many energy ministers are attending the ADEPEC conference. The outlook means OPEC is justified in only raising production gradually, according to Secretary General Mohamed Barkindo. The comments are another signal that OPEC and its partners will continue resisting U.S. pressure to pump faster and will stick to their strategy at their next meeting early next month. And this is just in as the Algerian national team is playing against Burkina Faso in Mustafa Chakar Stadium. And uh, apparently Algeria has scored 2-0 two, two against uh, Burkina Faso. And now let's move to another story where Washington expressed its denunciation of Moscow's dangerous behavior in its anti-satellite missile test, warning that the, this test has left thousands of debris, which threatens to the safety of astronauts working on the International Space Station. Noor Khimilat Melissa reports. Russia fired a projector into space to destroy one of its own satellites. Dangerous, reckless, irresponsible, this is how Washington described Russia's missile test that it says endangered the crew aboard the International Space Station. 
creating thousands of debris that forced the ISS-7 astronauts to shelter in capsules. NASA issued a statement saying that it will continue monitoring the debris in the coming days and beyond to ensure the safety of its crew in orbit. And finally, earlier today, the... U.S. officials emphasized the long-term dangers and potential global economic fallout from the Russian test, which has created hazards for satellites that provide people around the world with phone and broadband service, weather forecasting, GPS systems which underpin aspects of the financial system, including bank machines, as well in flight entertainment and satellite radio and television, and thus a threat to the interests of the whole world. Russia's space agency reacted to the criticism, saying its main priority is the safety of the ISS crew, and downplay the incident, saying that the orbit of the object which forced the crew today to move into spacecraft according to standard procedures has moved away from the ISS orbit and that the station is in the green zone. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.